The Fourier transform is one of the most popular and powerful transforms that are used for signal processing and analysis. It is related to the Laplace transform, but it's actually a special case. It has applications not just in signal processing, but in image processing and in uncertainty and wave theory. It's, it's a very broad class of, of analysis that moves again a time domain signal or a time domain function into a different domain. In this case, the Fourier domain, which is actually the frequency domain. The equation for the Fourier transform is written in terms of f of omega. So now we're taking it as a function of frequency, right? This is some transform that we will be, it will be in the domain of omega as opposed to time. And it's equal to the integral negative infinity to infinity of the function of interest, whatever it happens to be. Uh, let's go back and make this function of t times e to the negative j omega t dt. And so what we have is a function that uh, is this integral that is taking the function in terms of time, multiplying it by this e to the j omega t term and integrating that for all time. And since you integrate out t, you're left with a function that's now only in terms of omega, and that's where you get f of omega. We're now in the time domain. Sorry, in the, in the frequency domain. Now, the Fourier transform only works and it's only useful for looking at steady state signals. It doesn't, take, doesn't handle transient responses. And the reason for that is largely because of the way this term operates. This is just a slightly different representation of Euler's identity, right? It's e to the negative i times theta over here. And what this means, what this expression means is that it takes the function and wraps it around the unit circle with some wrapping frequency omega. And since that's the input, you can change the, you get the, the, the value of the transform for any given omega that you can put in. And so this tells you what the function is doing at a particular wrapping frequency. And the output of this will be complex. It will be, have both a real component and a complex component for any given frequency that you, ch that you decide to put in. So what does, this, what does this mean practically? Again, understand that we are doing this for all time, right? Negative infinity to infinity. And we're doing it for arbitrary continuous f frequencies. What it means is you can't actually practically perform this, in, this continuous frequency, continuous time, all time transform, Fourier transform on a computer. It's not possible. Instead, what's happening here is that this is only an analytical tool to help build intuition for what the Fourier transform does. So at a high level, what the Fourier transform does is it takes a signal that's initially in the time domain, and it may look something like this, just as an example, but it exists before and after as well. And when we pass this through the Fourier transform, what we get is a new function in term, a new mapping that's now in terms of omega, in terms of frequency. And that actually happens to be two-sided. So it's actually omega like this. And then we have f of omega here. But since it's complex, I need actually a third 
I need a third index here, a third axis here, if I were to draw both. So instead, just for the purposes of this, we're going to draw the magnitude of that transform. So we're taking the magnitude of the complex, of the complex number. And this is going to represent the magnitude of the Fourier transform at a particular frequency. And it's going to be symmetric across the zero because you have positive frequency it must be symmetric with the negative frequency. Now, negative frequency doesn't really exist. It's not an actual thing. But mathematically, it will come out because there's nothing stopping this thing from wrapping forwards, right, which is going counterclockwise versus if you put a negative omegas here, it'll just wrap counterclockwise. So negative j is going to wrap this way as this is positive and negative omegas, so we'll simply wrap it counterclockwise. And those have to be the same. It's a symmetric operation. So what that means is that the Fourier transform will always be symmetric about the, about the omega equals zero axis. And so if you did this in, for this function, you might get something that looks, I don't know, something like that, right? where the power as the frequency goes to infinity falls off because there's just le not less power there. And then it'll look symmetric like that. And so this is supposed to be perfectly symmetric. And what this represents is the power in any given frequency of this signal. What this is fundamentally saying is that you can break down any arbitrary function, any arbitrary input signal into a series of sines and cosines, because that's really all this is, right? This is either the I omega is just cosine omega t plus i sine omega t, right? That's what this breaks down into. And what this is saying is that there's some magnitude, right? If you, if you take impulses of every single one of these and continuously impulse everything for that given omega, then you're basically building sines and cosines at those frequencies. And when you add them all back up, you're going to end up reconstructing this underlying signal. And this is true of any signal, any signal that you can represent as a function can be decomposed into its, into its frequency representation with sines and cosines, which is really quite cool. And that's the basics of the Fourier transform. A couple of interesting things to point out is that one of the reasons, just like in the Laplace domain, that this is extremely useful is that if you have a, a Fourier transform and that represents the impulse function, then convolution in the convolution in the time domain is multiplication in the Fourier domain. So if you have some input signal u of t and you want to convolve it with some filter, we'll call that f of t, then to get some output y of t, which is the filtered signal, well, if again, if this is, an, if this is a linear time invariant filter that we're using, then you can pass this through the Fourier transform and do this in the Fourier space, where u of omega times f of omega, assuming this is the impulse function, right? Um, then this becomes the Fourier transfer function, gives you y of omega. So again, convolution in the time domain is multiplication in the Fourier domain, in the frequency domain, and then you can take the inverse Fourier transform of this to get your y of t without having to do the convolution. Very useful property that's often applied for, for filtering. And one of the big reasons, one of the primary uses of the Fourier transform is for signal filtering and signal processing. Many properties of the Fourier transform that, uh, of the Laplace transform that you might be familiar with are also present uh, with the Fourier transform. It is linear. It is time invariant. Which is great. And a lot of the basic mappings work out as well. The Fourier transform of one is just the delta function. Fourier transform of one is just the delta function. The Fourier transform of the delta function is just one. The Fourier transform of e to the ix, 
e to the i or j let's do j e to the j a t is going to be equal to delta function omega minus a is it a yes that's a sorry minus a or alpha it doesn't matter so there this is representing time shifting or shifting in the frequency domain which is just right multiplication by j omega t which is a rotation some rotation in the complex plane which is nice and there's a whole bunch of other properties that you can look up as as tables uh, that, are, that are present in the tables but a lot of the intuition from the Laplace transform will carry over to the Fourier transform but where the Fourier transform gets interesting is when you start to look at this specific form realize that even though this is fully continuous both in time and in frequency there are steps that you can take to begin to break this down to make it more applicable and more useful for something that can be manipulated by a computer and we'll be looking at that process in just a little bit in the subsequent videos the discrete time Fourier transform is often referred to as the DTFT the DTFT, right, the discrete time Fourier transform is the first step in taking the continuous time, continuous frequency Fourier transform that we saw in the previous video and converting it to something that's slightly more accessible but still not totally accessible by a computer. The equation that describes the discrete time Fourier transform is Again, written in terms of F, where we're taking capital F. I'm going to put this omega here. So we're going to be converting to frequency, omega. Yeah. But instead of being an integral, because that's what continuous time would be, instead we're going now via a summation from n equaling negative infinity to infinity, where we have some function f, uh, maybe I should not make that n, I should make that t so that we know that we're talking about time, negative infinity to infinity of f of t, ah, forget it, I'll do this, f of t, times e to the negative j omega t. So same thing, same general idea, right? It looks very, very similar to the integral, but instead we don't have infinitesimal, we're not integrating with it with respect to t anymore. Instead what we're doing is we're taking some fixed number of steps, right? We're deciding some interval of t with which we were going to step across the negative infinity to infinity space and now perform the same computation. You might be wondering why this is a useful thing to do. Well, this is useful because that's the way that data is digitized, right? When we talk about a signal that's represented in a computer or numerically analyzed, we don't have continuous time. We have instead samples of that function, right? The, the microphone is picking up the voice, my voice, at some fixed sampling rate. And that's what is being marched across here. T represents the sampling rate at which we are, we are moving across this, this function. Now note, in this situation, Omega here is still continuous because we can put any omega we want. It can be 5, it can be 70, it can be 36.425, it doesn't matter. Any arbitrary omega that's continuous can still into the DTFT. And the fact that this is now conti still continuous is the reason that it can't be implemented by a computer uh, to perform analysis well. 
So again, this is very similar to our to our continuous Fourier transform, our general Fourier transform counterpart, but because it is operating in discrete time, because time is being sampled step by step, this actually introduces a new idea. It introduces the idea of sampling. And sampling, the moment you start sampling a signal, you no longer know that signal precisely. And this is the field of sampling theory. When you no longer know a signal precisely, that means that you only have an estimate of that signal at, and, uh, uh, in general. And you, worse, you only know the value of that signal, that, of that input, whatever this FFT is, at the particular times of interest. And that means that you don't actually know, you can never know the underlying signal that generated the samples that you got. What does this mean? Let's let's take a look at this for a second. There's, this is actually a very a very fundamental point of insight that helps explain once we start looking at what the plots of the discrete time forward transform look like, it'll all start to make sense. So let's pretend that we have over here some axis. And over here we have time. And we're looking at our f of t. All right, so we're looking at our f of t. And we've now got samples of our f of t. We've got, say we have one here. And these have to be equally sampled, right? They have to be equal spaces between our samples. And let's say we have another one here. And we have another one here. And we have another one here. Same spot, same spot. Yep. And let's put another one back down here. Let's see if I can do this correctly. Okay. If I were to draw a curve, right, the simplest curve that I could come up with to go through these sample points, right? These, these represent my f of t's, and I'm marching across. I'm marching across t at this fixed interval. Pretend these are these, these all of these are equally spaced apart, and I happen to get these points when I sampled it this time and this time and this time and this time. Let's say this represents, I don't know, you know, five hertz or something. It doesn't matter how fast I'm sampling this, but let's say these are the points I got out of my sample. If I wanted to now reconstruct the underlying signal that I sampled, what would it look like? Well, it might look, for example, something like this. It could look as an example like this. No, that didn't go through the point. Let's try it again. And that's a reasonable, right? It's just we can say it's a sine, a sine wave or a cosine curve, curve, doesn't matter, some sinusoid, that is passing through these points perfectly in phase. Lovely. I guess I didn't get that last point correct, but let's just try it again. Okay, good enough. However, there is an equally likely and just as plausible explanation for the sampled points that we got here in green, and I'll, and I'll highlight them again one more time to make them clear. But this point, and this point is the wrong color, isn't it? This point, this point, this point, this point, and this point. There is an equally likely curve that I can draw, that I'll draw in just a moment. And I'll do that one in this light blue that could just as likely be the reason for the signal. And that's a, a, a curve that looks like this. Oh, that didn't go so right, but let's try this part again. 
And this curve happens to have a frequency exactly twice. The, the blue one happens to have a frequency that's twice the yellow one. And note, it goes through every single one of the points just as well. Except I can't draw very well, so it looks a little funky. And now the problem is, the moment you start sampling the data, sampling the continuous signal, you cannot differentiate whether the underlying signal was the yellow one or the blue one, because they both result in the green sampled points. And there is no possible way at all to tell the difference. What's worse is that there's an infinite number of multiples of frequencies that could lead to exactly the same points on these greens. Not just the yellow one or the blue one that's twice that, but also another curve that I could draw that's three times the yellow one, or four times the yellow one, or five times the yellow one. Every proper multiple of that frequency is going to end up, well, not half, sorry, not three times, but twice, 2x, 4x, uh, 8x, right? Every, every doubling of the frequency that we're talking about here of the underlying frequency, the base frequency in yellow, would also hit these green points exactly. And thus you would never be able to tell the difference as to whether you, you sampled from the yellow curve, the blue curve, or any of the other multiples that go through these points. That's what sampling theory is telling you. And this is a direct consequence. The reason for this idea, this idea thus will help you understand why the, the DTFT looks the way it does. So if we took a signal, some arbitrary signal, and it doesn't matter what, you know, we can take some, some, you know, some random signal, and we took its discrete time Fourier transform of it, we would get again something that is going to be in terms of omega, with it being symmetric on both sides. And let's say that for the sake of argument, it looks something like that. Well, let's, make it, let's make it symmetric. So it looks like that, and it looks like that, just for the sake of argument. You are gonna end up with an exact copy of this Fourier, of this transform, shifted exactly two pi away on both sides. There will be a perfect copy of that transform over here and over here. Both of these represent this blue curve, for example. In fact, let's put those in those colors because then it'll make very crisp sense. If the Fourier transform of the yellow line the yellow time series line represents this. Then you're going to get Fourier transforms of every double, every 2x double, right? Every multiple of that frequency set over here on this side. So that's going to be the blue one here and another copy of the blue one here. Because again, you can't differentiate multiplying by two frequency positive or two frequency negative. And that is a very, very critical concept. The moment you sample the data, the moment you have intervals with which you are looking at your signal, you end up with an infinite number of copies of the Fourier transform. You have to, because again, you can't differentiate between these. What this means is that practically, if we are dealing with sampled data, and if that's all we ever deal with in the real world, your CD-ROM samples at 44,100 hertz. Not that anyone uses CD-ROMs anymore, but right, the frequency of sampling of a CD is 44,100 hertz. For every second of data, there's 44,100 points in the time domain. 
your MP3 files are sim similarly sampled at something like this. They're, sometimes they'll be at 44,000, they call that CD quality, otherwise they'll be sampled at you know 22,000 or sometimes they'll go even crazy at like 96,000. Really high-end audio equipment can sample at 96,000 or something like that hertz, 96,000 uh, 96, hertz, yeah. What this fundamentally means is that when you are storing digitized, discrete, sampled data, you have to be mindful of your sampling rate and what that does to your discrete time for your transform representation. Why? Well, the rate at which you sample represents now, the, will give you an upper limit on the lowest frequency, the, the, whatever the yellow will look like, the lowest yellow that you can properly disentangle from anything else. What do I mean by this? Yellow in this case is the lowest frequency that we can perfectly understand. Well, not necessarily, but let's just pretend it is. If this was, right, if this yellow was the lowest frequency that we could sorry, the highest frequency that we are no longer unambiguous about, meaning any frequency slower than yellow, we, we can perfectly reconstruct up until yellow, and then every multiple of yellow we have very little insight into. That yellow, that, this actual highest level frequency, corresponds to something over here at the edge of the, of the discrete time Fourier transform. And since these are copied out every two pi, the sampling rate will determine how far apart these blobs of the Fourier transform are. And the slower the sampling rate, the less ticks you take, the closer these two become in the, in the frequency space. What's worse, is that should these tips ever overlap, should this tip ever overlap with this tip because you're sampling too slowly, you no longer can perfectly discriminate the frequency information that is contained in the signal. What does this mean? Fundamentally, if what we believe, if you know, for example, that there's no actual frequencies of the color blue or higher, in your signal, right, in the signal that you're measuring, then you can reject all the other copies of the discrete time Fourier transform except for this one. In fact, you do precisely that. You do what's called a, a block filter where you just go in and, um, or a, a, a brick wall filter, and you just pick out just this section of the Fourier transform. You throw away this and this and all the other multiple infinite copies above and below because you know that the highest frequency of interest that you, your signal can contain is over here, right? Within, within the walls, within this Fourier transform. It's within, it's, it's within, it's somewhere between this space before the next copy begins. Then guess what? You're safe. You'll never get confused about what frequency information is present in the original signal versus its two pi shift. If you have these that are overlapping, you have a problem called aliasing. Aliasing is, occurs when you haven't sampled fast enough and your tips of your discrete time for your transform are overlapping, confusing your ability to determine whether or not power in some particular space belongs to this copy of the Fourier transform of the DTFT or this copy of the DTFT. And the way to solve that is by increasing your sampling rate. Now comes the fun part. When you increase your sampling rate, the spacing at which these start to separate is exactly by half the increase in your rate. So if you increase by two hertz, your sampling rate, you push space, you add one hertz of gap here and one hertz of gap here. That's why it 
It's, that's why you need to increase by two to get both sides. Now, with that understanding, you can now, you can now understand why CD quality is 44,100 hertz. It's because the, the, the range of typical human hearing is cut off at around 20, hertz, 20 kilohertz. And based on the Nyquist frequency, the Nyquist frequency is 2x the highest frequency of interest. That's what the Nyquist frequency is. It's, it's, it is telling you that if, as long as you are sampling at twice the highest, at greater than, at greater than or equal to, and you always want to be slightly greater than, greater than 2x the highest frequency of interest for the particular signal that you're trying to capture, then you'll be able to perfectly reconstruct your signal. Why? Because if you take the inverse discrete time Fourier transform of the block of interest right along the center, you're guaranteed not to have the tips overlap and thus you can completely reconstruct your signal by taking the inverse of this Fourier transform. That's phenomenally powerful. And so with all of that, you now know why we have CD quality sampling at 44,100 hertz. The range, the upper range for normal human hearing is 20 kilohertz. Normal human hearing is 20 kilohertz. What then is the Nyquist frequency for human hearing? If you were to digitize a signal to make sure that a, a typical uh, individual right, can hear that sound that you're hearing now properly reproduced when if a computer is playing it back, you need to sample at twice that upper limit of what people can hear, which is two times 20 kilohertz, which is 40 kilohertz. And just for good measure, they rounded that out to 44, 1, There's a 44,100. There's a few other nuances behind that, but it's basically ensuring that they are above the Nyquist frequency of human hearing, which is 20 kilohertz. Thus ensuring that when they take the DTFT, they're not overlapping in this space, such that if people cannot hear about 20 kilohertz, then that is the highest frequency of interest. We're not interested in, in capturing sound above 20, 20 kilohertz for the purposes of human hearing. Very powerful ideas. This is sampling theory. It is fundamentally indistinguishable and inseparable from the discrete time Fourier transform because the moment you start marching along a signal by sampling as opposed to taking the continuous signal, which is what the only way that we can deal with it in computers, then you are forced to reconcile with an infinite possible number of frequencies that could have resulted in that sampled set of green dots that you have. And thus, in your Fourier domain, you end up with copies of the Fourier transform, an infinite number of copies of your Fourier transform, copied and stamped out every two pi spacing. And as a result of that, right, with every 2x multiple of your, of your, of your omega, as a result, you now can then derive and understand and explain why the Nyquist frequency is what it is. In order for you to faithfully reproduce any fundamental signal that you are measuring, if you know the highest frequency of interest, be ensured that you're sampling it twice that to give yourself enough room so that the copies of your DTFT do not overlap, so that you are now able to reject all other higher frequency versions of the signal you're trying to measure because you know they don't exist. They are not the solutions that gave you these green dots and that only the one in the middle, the primary one of interest, the primary copy of the DTFT is indeed the one that led to the green dots of interest. And thus you can take only that copy out, throw out all the others and do the inverse of this to get you your reproduced signal perfectly.
Having walked through the Fourier transform, the discrete time Fourier transform, and the basics of sampling theory, we're now finally at the point where we can talk about the practical implementation. The transform, the discrete Fourier transform, that is discrete both in time and in frequency, which is the version that can be implemented numerically on a computer. This is the primary workhorse. Well, technically, it's the fast Fourier transform, which is an implementation, a highly efficient implementation of the DFT. But this algorithm's idea is the workhorse that is present in almost every digital system in existence, from your phone to your monitors to your computers to anything that deals with signals or data or images. Everything is performing a DFT or an inverse DFT. That's how fundamental these are to the operation of, of data and signals in our, in our world. So what is the equation for the DFT? The DFT is gonna be again, right? Something that's gonna convert a function into its frequency domain space. And instead of it being a function of omega that's continuous, instead we have an index, k we'll call it. Because now not only are we moving, and not only have we discretized time, right? Time has been sampled. Now even the frequencies themselves are being binned and marched across. So we can't just put an arbitrary frequency anymore. We only have frequency bins, and that's directly related to the number of samples that we are dealing with. And it's related to the Nyquist frequency. We'll unpack this in a moment. This is now going to be a vector, and it's going to be a vector that's going to be F. And we'll still call this T, but again, I'm going to subscript it because this is a vector. And we're going to multiply this by e to the negative. Now instead of j, but it's going to be oops, j. And it's going to be 2 pi over n times k times t. This two pi over n is similar to omega, but this two pi represents this two pi k is very similar to omega. But now we're dealing with two pi because this n here represents the number of signals, the number of samples in our vector that we that we're starting to that we're going to be using to pass through the DFT. Again, I'll, uh, this will make a little more sense. We still have t. T will go away, we're gonna end up with a vector. So this is f of t, and we're basically taking the t indexed point, and we are gonna sum all of this. I forgot to write the summation, didn't I? Let's come back here and write the summation. We have to sum all of this from t equals zero, to t equals n minus one. That's not a good n minus one, let's rewrite that. n minus one. What's going on here is that we are taking some underlying vector. So again, we don't even have a continuous signal anymore. We just have our sampled sets. So it's just like the discrete time uh, Fourier transform where we have sampled data points. But now we're explicitly talking about very, very clear numerical operations. We have a vector. This is going to be our f. And our vector is going to have values in it. It's going to have f of 0, f of 1, f of 2, dot, 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 f of n minus 1, well, I guess it's going to be f of n minus 2. And f of n minus 1. So there are n points in our vector, right, starting at 0. It's important to start at 0 for the math to work out. 
starting at f of zero, going to f of n. These are just these are just numbers. They're just numbers. They represent the values of our signal sampled at some given frequency. I haven't told you what that frequency is yet, but it's important to know what it is because that will impact um, the considerations of what the Nyquist frequency is when you pass it through. But fundamentally, the DFT actually doesn't care what the frequency sampling frequency is. It will simply give you something in terms of two pi, and it's your job to sort of map that back into the frequency of interest. And when we're done with all of this, we're going to get a new vector, f, that's been transformed, where this is now f of 0 and f of 1 and f of 2, dot, 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 and f of n minus 2 and f of n minus 1. And these are going to be vector points that represent different frequency bins of interest. And they will go, they will span from DC all the way out to the Nyquist frequency. Now I'm not gonna, in this video, explain uh, exactly what those bins are here because it's a little more complicated. It's not purely linear. Um, but understand that if there are n points here, there are n points that come out in here. But remember that the, the Fourier transform is limited to the Nyquist frequency. And so then only roughly half of these points are going to be unique and informative because the other half are going to represent the negative frequency about a component of that, right? The DFT is still uh, like any other Fourier transform where it requires right twice the sampling in order to get because it's got to span both sides of the frequency space and so these points actually correlate one set to the positive end the other end is the conjugates which represent the freak with the negative frequencies and then there's the Nyquist frequency that may or may not exist and the DC value so if endpoints go in, endpoints come out, and you're those that will tell you something, uh, that will give you the frequencies uh, of interest in now bins as opposed to point frequencies. So each of these points represents some bin of frequencies that 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 value represents, and not any point frequency. Because again, you've now sampled not just in time by sampling, but you're now sampling explicitly you're iterating in bins of frequencies that's why it's discrete and because this is discrete in both time and frequency it can now be actually uh, uh, performed numerically by a computer extremely powerful technique and so the plots of this are not that different it's just individual points as opposed to co continuous functions if we take a look at this right and we have again omega, then instead of some continuous line that I will draw that I did, for example, for the DTFT case for the discrete time Fourier transform, where we had copies, there's no copies here anymore. Instead, what we have is just a series of points. And it will look something like this. There'll be some DC value, then there'll be a value here, 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 and here, and here, and again, It'll be symmetric, so there'll be points here, and here, and here, and here, and here. And this is supposed to be symmetric, so that's just my, my poor art. And that's what's going on, right? This is what the ultimate graph will look like of the, of the discrete Fourier transform, uh, in a similar vein of what the ones that we saw before. Where, again, you can't go to arbitrary, arbitrary frequencies anymore. You only have the binned values and each point represents some, some range of frequencies for, each, for where, where it represents. Again, here we're plotting the magnitude of f of k. This is a magnitude plot. Because again, these, can be, these are complex. And that means there's both a magnitude and a phase, and that phase will tell you where the phase of that cosine or sine is in that, in that space. That's the basics of the discrete time for the discrete Fourier transform. This is the workhorse of of signal processing, and it, it's extremely efficient. They've, there's very very optimal ways of of, uh, of calculating this. That's called the fast Fourier transform, which is the one that's most commonly used. 
Um, and it, it can perform this operation in a very optimized manner so that it is deployed quite widely. In subsequent videos, we'll take a closer look at the Fourier transform, both in continuous space to see if we can build a stronger, uh, stronger set of intuition behind exactly what it's doing when it wraps around this, I, this E to the I space. And then we'll also look at a practical implementation on, with some hands-on work, looking at the, D, at, the, at the FFT function itself to see if we can better understand what it means when it transfers a set of time series values, right? This is time and this is frequency. When it converts from time to frequency in that, in that FFT function. So in this video, we'll be walking through a small demo of the, of the Fourier transform. Explic specifically, we're looking very closely at that expression where we have f of t e to the negative j omega t. And we're going to be looking at this function and what this expression means when we integrate it from right, anything to anything, right? So technically, we're supposed to integrate it from negative infinity to infinity. But of course, we can't do that numerically because that's impossible. So instead, we're going to look at a very fixed range instead and see if we can understand exactly what this expression of the Fourier transform, the, the heart of what's going on in the middle here, is doing for some limited DTs and see if we can, we can start to get a sense of what this is talking about. So we're going to be looking at this in Collaboratory, which is just a free tool that's available by Google that lets you implement Python uh, on the browser. All free, anyone who has a Gmail account or anything like that um, can just sign up and use this. I strongly recommend it as a nice exploratory tool because it does a good job of making sense of what's going on. So here we're going to pull in NumPy and Matplotlib. No problem. I don't need that anymore. Let's go ahead and do that. So importing numpy matplotlib so it's going to connect and load come on come on come on uh, this is a little disclosure saying that right we're only performing the Fourier transform over a very fixed range and it's it's only going to help us with for the purposes of of a visualization it's not actually going to be performing the Fourier transform correct at all because well we can't do that and, but nonetheless, this is good for intuition building. So we've got a bad approximation, all that stuff, fully disclosed. Let's go ahead and recognize that we're gonna take a very relatively small DT. Um, this DT is gonna be something like 0 0.001. And here for the purposes of this understanding, we're gonna go from zero to one. And I'll explain that I've taken that omega and I've put out two pi times some wrapping frequency. So I've unpacked I've just simply converted, right? I've converted our f of t e to the j omega t, and I've converted it instead to f of t e to the negative j 2 pi f t, where this f is the f um, of the frequency of interest, right? So this is f omega equal to that, for example, minus the integrals. We'll get rid of these. All right, this omega is just 2 pi f. And this f is the frequency of interest that we're probing to calculate what this expression looks like. Now, this is called a wrapping frequency. And it makes sense why. Because the higher this goes, then for any given 0 to 1, right, we're only spanning t from 0 to 1 here. For any 0 to 1, you're going to spin more or less number of times around the unit circle uh, depending on this value of f. So I'm calling this f the wrapping frequency. And it is exactly the same as the f of omega or the f of f, right, if you were doing this in terms of frequency, that you'd be putting into and probing, right, evaluating the Fourier transform at a particular frequency. So this is the same. It's going to be key, though, understanding why this f is the wrapping frequency it will tell you and help you explain why, why it does the probing that it does and how it helps pull out a particular frequency in here 
right, in our f function, in, our, in the function that we're trying to understand, um, uniquely for some frequencies and not for others. If there is some fundamental frequency at which this f is changing at, right, is oscillating at, is if this is a sign of a particular function of a particular frequency, when then this f equals that f, then something very interesting happens to this expression. And for all other frequencies, it basically cancels out and things go to effectively zero. And that's what's going on in the Fourier transform. That's why it can pick out frequencies of interest. Because for some function f, it will get larger or smaller based on whether or not that f is contained, that frequency, wrapping frequency is contained within the, this uh, frequency of interest here. So let's clear this all away and continue to work through. So we're back here. We're running over this DT. And for the purposes of this simulation, I'm picking a function here, defining it as function f of t, and I'm calling the sine function with a nominal natural frequency of 6, so 2 pi 6 t. So 2 pi, 2 pi 6 is the omega, and 6 happens to be the frequency with which this sine will go from, will cycle at from as t goes from 0 to 1. Great. Now, I've chosen a wrapping frequency of 4, and we're going to see what happens, right? That was the f that we were talking. We're going to see what happens as we change our wrapping frequency to other frequencies. This f product is simply that function that I was writing before. It's the f itself, right? f of t times e to the negative j times 2 pi f t. The same thing I was doodling up here. This is just the, in Python form. Then we're going to plot the real component times the, uh, by the imaginary component. So we're going to plot in an axis, real and imaginary, of this wrapping thing. And all of this line that goes over to the side is just a line that helps us sort of format the plot in a nice way. And then down below, uh, down below, this is going to do some actual calculations of, of the Fourier transform with some numerics that are useful for us. Okay, so let's run this and see what we get. So when we run this, we get something that looks like this. It's very interesting. This is a plot of what happens when you take t and go from 0 to 1 with a wrapping frequency of 4 through the Fourier transform for the function sine 2 pi 6t. It looks like this. It started over here. It went this way. And then 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 it went this way and stopped here. That's what it did. It's very pretty, right? It's a nice little rose. But the key things to understand here is that the Fourier transform at four hertz, when you then integrate this, so all of this is now integrated, right? We're summing up all of the area of that line, right? So if you take a look at all of the area under the curve for all of this, and we multiply it by our dt, then that would give us an approximation for the integral Again, only between 0 and 1, but nonetheless, that's extremely valuable still. Note that it's 0. That sum is 0. That means every single curve here fully cancels out with the other end, and the integral is 0. Thus, this magnitude of the Fourier transform is 0. Then when the magnitude is 0, there's also a phase we can calculate, but the phase is irrelevant if the magnitude is 0, so you don't need to worry about what the phase is. Now let's think about it for other wrapping frequencies. Let's try, oh, I don't know. Where is that? It's here. Let's try for the sake of argument two and see what we get. We get that. Interesting. That's pretty. What this is, the reason this looks a little thicker is because it actually wrapped along itself multiple times. So it went this way, this way, this way, and actually did this at least one more time, maybe even two more times. I'm not sure. Let's try uh, three. There's three. So again, it's being wrapped around. Basically, all we're doing is we're taking the sine wave, and right? so to understand what this is doing visually, is we're taking the sine wave, and we're multiplying it by e to the i theta. And e to the i theta will just take it and wrap it around this axis. So it's just sort of taking this and wrapping it around, and as a function of, oops, as a function of the, as a function of this wrapping frequency here, three, it will do so 
three times, right? As it goes from zero to one. Why? Because that's what it means to go from zero to one uh, times times two pi three times. That's what that wrapping frequency does. So two pi t times the wrapping frequency three means that it's going to make, it's actually going to go from zero to six pi, which is going to be three cycles around the unit circle, which is actually pretty cool. And so let's see, right? One, two, three. Look at that. Let's try it for two. See what we I'm going to get rid of this annotation. It's in the way. So let's run that too. This is what it looks like for two. So that means it's got to do two cycles around. One, two. And we're back there again. And so let's go back to four. So this is going to go around four times. It's going to make four loops. One, two, three, four. Actually, I'm, I'm lost track. I don't know how fast it's actually moving. But again, you could make sense of it if you were to, if you were to actually, if you were to actually count. Now, note every single one of these magnitudes has all been, oops, has all been at zero, right? No matter what version, no matter what are these numbers we've been taking whether it's two or four or three, the magnitude of the Fourier transform has still been zero. That's true for, true for three, oh, it's still zero. It's true for four, let's look at for five. Right, ooh, that's really pretty. Love it, lots of stuff, but still, magnitude of the Fourier transform, the area under all of these summed together is zero because we have a balance, right, between the left and the right and the up and the down. The Fourier transform value is still zero, both in the real space and in the imaginary space. So real is over, real is this axis, imaginary is this axis. We sum it all up, we're still sitting at zero. Now, something very interesting happens when we go to six. When we are at six, it is a perfect circle. And thus the magnitude right, of the Fourier transform is non-zero anymore. Why? Because the area under this curve is exactly half. Because it's got a radius, right? Um, this is extremely powerful because the moment we, let's say we go to seven now. And we're back to something that's fully symmetric with the value of zero magnitude of zero. Do you think it's an accident that the, re the only point in this entire plot for all possible wrapping frequencies, the only value that is non-zero is six? Definitely not. That is not an accident. What happens if we do like 5.8? I don't know. Let's actually try that. Well, we get something that doesn't quite complete. Why? Because again, we're only going from zero to one. That's, that's the confusing factor. So we have to go and, done, and do this, not just for zero to one, but for, for a much larger range, if we're talking about, if we're talking about fractions. So let's stick with our whole numbers because they will get us back nice and neatly. So it is not a coincidence that the wrapping frequency here is six and the actual frequency of the sinusoid is six. And that's the one value for which our Fourier wrapping transform, right? The wrapping of the Fourier transform and the magnitude of that, of that transform is non-zero. That is not a coincidence. In fact, that's the entire purpose of the Fourier transform is to pick out the frequencies, the natural frequencies of the function of interest itself. And it does so by ensuring that when you wrap it at the same frequency of one of the components of the actual function itself, that the magnitude of the area underneath the curve, the magnitude of the Fourier transform, if you integrate then all of the area that's left, it's gonna come out to something on zero. And that's extremely powerful. That is the Fourier transform in action. That's super cool.
This is why it works. And this will work for any arbitrary signal. It doesn't have to be some really pretty sign that has a fixed frequency of six. It can work for some super ugly functions. Heck, it can work for some arbitrary signals that don't even look like they might be sines and cosines. And it will still figure out the frequencies for which the value of this wrapping is non-zero because that's what the Fourier transform does. And when you plot then the magnitude, if you then go to plot the magnitude of the Fourier transform, for this particular sine function, what you're gonna get is something that's zero everywhere unless we're talking about the value of six or negative six. Yeah, we can also do negative six, right? Let's try that for a second. Let's see what negative six is gonna give us. Aha, it gives us the upper side. And of course, the magnitude of the Fourier transform is the same, it's still 0.5, so this is 0.5 and this is 0.5. It has to be, so here, 0.5. Now, of course, this is only for the range 0 to 1, right? What's going to happen? What's going to happen if we take this and we go from negative, say, 5 or 5 to negative 5? Let's go from, let's go back to 6 just to make it less confusing. Now we're going over a larger range. Do you expect the magnitude to get larger? Of course you do. Oops, I didn't update this value. All right, and look, now our value of the magnitude is five. Well, what happens if we go even more? What if we go to 50, negative 50 to 50? Are we gonna get a larger magnitude? We're gonna get an even larger magnitude. We're gonna get 50 now. Oh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't update this, did I? No, I did, sorry. Let's go to 500. And now our magnitude of the transform is 500. So what happens if we truly do the full transform from negative infinity to infinity? What's gonna to happen to the magnitudes of these points, right? That's gonna result in an infinite magnitude at six and negative six and zero everywhere else. What is the term? for a value for a function that is infinitely large at one point and zero everywhere else? Yep, delta function. And so what is true is that the Fourier transform of a, of a cosine or a sine, doesn't matter, the magnitude of the of a Fourier transform of a cosine or a sine is equal to the delta function, let's call this W naught, minus time shifted or frequency shifted by that W naught. And that is super cool, right? We have here a cosine function, which is something we know extremely well, can describe very, very well in the time domain. Right? This should be this needs to be omega t but you get the idea. And in the Fourier representation of it, it is a pulse of infinite amplitude, of infinite power, right? Infinite magnitude, delta function. And here we've just proven it. This little exercise where we increased the range at which we were sampling over, our, uh, performing our, our, our DT over, demonstrates to us that the magnitude is going to continue to grow as you scale, as you scale and grow your range. And thus, when you go to negative infinity to infinity, your magnitude of Fourier transform is going to become infinity, and that's your back in your higher delta function. So we've just now proven the, the, the delta, the, the Fourier transform of a particular, of a, partic of a sine or a cosine. It's all the same. Oops, I left that one at, at, okay. And so hopefully this little exercise helps you understand what the Fourier transform is actually doing when it is multiplying by this seemingly weird e to the j omega term. 
what it's doing is it's taking your function and wrapping it around the unit circle a number of times based on that wrapping frequency, that omega that you're choosing. And then it's integrating over it. And for all non natural frequencies, for frequencies that are not contained in the actual function itself, when you do that for negative infinity to infinity, you're going to get something that's effectively zero. Uh, not effectively, it is zero because there's everything is, all of the wrappings are going to cancel out. It's going to be equally, it's going to be equally large above and below the, uh, the origin and to the left and to the right. So the imaginary component is going to be zero and the real component is going to be, sorry, real component is going to be zero, imaginary component is going to be zero. However, for those very few frequencies that are actually present in the function itself, that's why this six and this six matches up, we get a situation where we are now only on one side of this axis. And we can, if we're cosine, we're over here. If we're sine, we're down here on the, on the positive frequencies. For our negative frequency, we're over here. And you end up with a non-zero value for the Fourier transform. And you get a magnitude that's non-zero. And that is how this, this expression, how the Fourier transform pulls out the frequencies that are contained in the signal. It's an extremely valuable tool. It transforms a time domain signal that's hard to understand and analyze into a frequency domain signal for which the plot shows you the power, the magnitude plot shows you the power of that signal in a particular frequency. Indispensable for signal processing.